My name is Kafur Drasa, and I'm assistant professor and psychiatry resident in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, Neurobiology, and Bioengineering at the Duke University Medical Center. And today I'll tell you about the work going on in my lab aimed at discovering the role of neurocircuit dynamics in regulating emotion. In order to accomplish this, I'll begin by telling you a little bit about my personal background, as well as some of the background of major depressive disorder. I'll then share with you some of the major challenges the field has experienced in modeling complex emotional disorders and how this has led to a slow progression towards new treatments and cures. And finally, I'll tell you about the two initiatives ongoing in my lab. One aimed at mapping out brain networks in real time using machine learning, and then the second initiative aimed at modulating these neural networks using brain computer interface devices. And our hope is that these two initiatives will one day lead to a new class of therapeutics that can be used to treat humans suffering from this illness. I grew up in Silver Spring, Maryland and went to undergrad at UMBC. I was a Meyerhoff scholar and the goal of this program was to increase the number of underrepresented minorities going off to get PhDs in the sciences. After graduating with a degree in chemical engineering, I enrolled in the medical scientist training program at Duke University and finished with a PhD in neurobiology in 2007. My ultimate goal was to create brain computer interface devices to treat mental illness. After graduating from medical school, I enrolled in a unique training program that allowed me to spend half of my time in the clinic as a psychiatry resident and the other half of my time in the lab as an assistant professor. And the research objectives I'll describe to you are a reflection of the unique experiences I had going back and forth between these two environments. As I transitioned to independence, I decided to focus my lab in studying depression. The rationale was clear. Depression was projected to be the leading cause of disability in the developing world. Depression is diagnosed based on nine behavioral categories of which you have to have dysfunction in five. Depressed mood, diminished interest, increases or decrease in appetite, sleeping too much or too little, moving too much or too little, fatigue or loss of energy, worthlessness or guilt, decreased ability to think or concentrate, and recurrent thoughts of death or suicidality. And when you consider the nearly 3,000 suicides that occur in the world every single day, there are 20 times more suicide attempts. So depression isn't simply an illness of sadness, it's an illness with incredible morbidity and mortality. The goal of my lab as a physician scientist was to better understand the biology underlying this illness such that I can come up with new treatments and cures. Residency made it clear how daunting that challenge would be. So I came into clinic and had two patients waiting for me. The first one is a 66-year-old lady with poor mood, hypersomnia, feelings of worthlessness, psychomotor retardation, and fatigue. The second one was a 23-year-old man with anhedonia, insomnia, decreased concentration, significant weight loss, and suicidal thoughts. And at the end of these two patient encounters, they were both diagnosed with depression. Now, as an engineer, this was incredibly unsatisfying to me. Here were two patients with no overlapping symptoms whatsoever, and yet they still ended up with the same diagnosis. And it raised the question, do these individuals actually have a common biology? The challenge was equally as daunting about thinking about this from a scientific perspective in the lab. Now, it turns out if we think about animal models, we can't actually model or measure sadness, suicidality, or guilt some of the primary behavioral domains observed in depression. So how to overcome this? The approach that researchers have classically taken is to study the mechanism of action of agencies to treat illness. The agents classically used to treat depression are the tricyclic antidepressants, largely replaced by the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. The way these agents work, this is an example of a presynaptic nerve terminal, and this neurotransmitter serotonin is released into the synapse. These agents work by blocking the transporter that's responsible for the reuptake of serotonin, ultimately increasing the amount of serotonin available. So if these agents work by increasing the amount of serotonin available, this ultimately led to the serotonin hypothesis. Perhaps depression is due to a decrease in serotonin. Serotonin. The problem is that the sequent treatment alternatives to relieve depression, or STAR-D trial, sponsored by the National Institute of Mental Health, showed that SSRIs were only effective in 33% of individuals, and that could take 6 to 10 weeks. Furthermore, after four drug trials, more than a quarter of patients still showed profound impairments. And this suggested that the serotonin hypothesis was at best incomplete. So how to approach the biology? So the more patients I saw, the clearer it became that stress played a central role in major depressive disorder. Stress was there at the onset, stress made symptoms worse, and even in my patients that were doing well, stress led to the reoccurrence of their symptoms. 
So I concluded at that point in time that I could take advantage of stressor approach to biology. Namely, I can use three animal models of stress, chronic unpredictable stress, chronic repetitive stress, and chronic social defeat stress, and ask how stress impacted brain biology. My second clinical observation that really framed how I thought about approaching the biology depression was electroconvulsive therapy. Now this treatment has been around since the 1930s and is based on delivering pulses of electrical activity into the human brain. And while it's certainly associated with clinical side effects, it can relieve depressive symptoms in up to 90% of individuals. So if we were to apply the same logic we used to frame the serotonin hypothesis, one might come up with an electricity hypothesis in which the central biology problem in depression might be thought to be due to changes of electrical processing in the brain. While this may seem far-fetched, it turns out of the 160 billion cells in the human brain, about half of them directly process electricity. And there were certainly other clinical scenarios in which changes in electrical processing have been known to produce clinical problems, including epilepsy and cardiac arrhythmias. In order to test this electricity hypothesis, we're proposing to map out large-scale brain activity in depression, and then we have to engineer new ways of manipulating these signatures to show that they are indeed causal. So this frames the first objective of this proposal. Can we actually map electrical activity in an intact brain and then ask how stress changes the processing of that electrical activity? So in order to record electrical activity throughout the depth of a fully intact brain, we needed some new technology. So I was able to optimize an approach I had been working on in my grad school training. And this approach in my lab now has allowed us to record activity from 16 brain areas simultaneously in a fully intact mouse brain. This is a CT image of our approach, as well as that image co-registered onto an MRI atlas. And using this device, we're able to record cellular activity from 90 cells simultaneously located in these 16 areas, as well as these local field potentials. And these local field potentials, what people classically refer to as brain waves, will become the focus of the remainder of this talk. Each of these brain waves consists of waves of activity or oscillations that are located at individual frequency bands. And we can use tools borrowed from electrical engineering, this is signal processing, to filter out these waves and ask what is the concentration of each frequency band. And that gives us a measure of brain area power. We can also ask how these waves, when we record them from two different sites, how they correspond with each other across time you can see that the peaks of these two waves are lining up. And that measure is called coherence. How well do these two brain areas cohere across time? And that's an indication of circuit function. So here's our experimental schematic. We're gonna record electrical activity as a mouse performs in motivated behaviors. We're then gonna subject a mouse to stress. And then finally, we're gonna record electrical activity again as a mouse performs the same motivated behaviors it did before stress. And this will allow us to ask the central question, how did the stress exposure change electrical processing in the mouse's brain? For each brain error we've implanted, we'll extract oscillatory power across frequency bands and ask how that changed. We'll get hundreds of those measures for each animal. We're also gonna ask about how electrical processing between areas changed as a function of coherence. We'll get thousands of those measures. We'll repeat this process across multiple animals and then subject all of that data to machine learning. And what that allows us to do is to create an electrical map which tells us which changes in electrical signatures relates to the animal's behavioral change as a function of stress exposure. Here's what our map looks like. We'll call this our electrical functional connectome or electome for short. Around the rim, you can see all of our power measures. There's 80 per brain area for each frequency and for eight areas, prelimbic cortex, nucleus accumbens core, and the other areas we've been recording. And then you can see each of the coherence measures, which is our circuit measures, between areas. This is an example of a coherence measure between VTA and thalamus. If the measure is blue, it means the coherence weakens. If the measure is red, it means the coherence increases. So we're able to find all of these circuit signatures that tell us where the changes are that are behaviorally relevant. Then what we can do is ask about information flow or the direction of information processing. And when we map that onto our electome, we get a map of how electrical information processing in the brain changes as a result of a stress exposure. 
Now, as you can see from the map, we have an area of the brain called amygdala. And there's electrical flow changes between amygdala and a part of the brain called the dorsal hippocampus. And information processing along this pathway has been implicated in how organisms respond to stress. We also see changes in electrical information flow between VTA and nucleus accumbens. This pathway has been implicated in normal reward processing. And so what you see from our model is that this pathway is turned down as a result of the stress exposure. Again, in depression, stress can generate anhedonia or an inability to process or feel reward. And so that's something that would map directly onto the model that we create simply by looking at data and electrical processing in the brain. So once we're able to develop our full maps, the question becomes, can we use that map to generate a stimulation paradigm in which we can change electrical activity in part of the map and ultimately restore normal behavior? This would be a key process to ultimately generating a therapeutic device in humans. So as you can see, this is an example of the map that I just showed you. This is our preliminary map. And we'll focus on one key connection in the map between a part of the brain called infralimbic cortex implicated in depression in humans and a part of the brain called thalamus. Now, as you look at this map, you don't get a full sense of how complex that it is. So the information coming from infralimbic cortex, you can see that in green. That's our input signal. And you can see the response that can occur in the brain area called thalamus. You have a higher frequency signal, so the oscillations are much faster, but the increases in activity or the amplitude of the higher frequency signal corresponds with the input signal. So the challenge becomes, how do we figure out how to stimulate the brain with a pattern that matches the complexity that we're pulling out of our electrical map? In order to accomplish this, we developed a new brain-computer interface protocol as our preliminary model. And what we're able to do is extract information out of the animal's brain in real time. This pulls out information, 30,000 pieces of information every second. We're able to extract the real-time oscillation, so the brain wave that we're seeing in the part of the brain called infralimbic cortex, process it into a computer, and then generate higher frequency signals, the thalamic activity, and put that back into the animal's brain. The blue light in this case activates channel rhodopsin, which causes cells to fire or the wave to occur at a higher frequency. The yellow light is a control in this case. So as you can see here, we can generate this high frequency activity in thalamus time to real time oscillatory activity in the infralimbic cortex. So we're able to generate this network pattern that we see in our model. This just shows our ability to trigger the laser relative to activity in real time in infralimbic cortex. And we're able to do that with high statistical significance. In order to test the impact of our stimulation protocol, we use the classic tail suspension test. During this test, mice are hung upside down by their tail, and the amount of time they spend in mobile is inferred to be related to their despair. In depression models and stress models, mice spend much more time immobile in this task. You can see our control example, that's the yellow light condition. During the course of the 10 minute task, the amount of time the mice spend immobile increases as the task goes along. In our experimental case, these are animals that are getting stimulated, you can see that they spend much less time immobile. What this suggests is the electrical patterns that we found using our map, by stimulating them, we can override depression-related behaviors. This suggests that the electrical signatures are indeed causal. So if our aims are successful, we believe that it will one day lead to a new class of diagnostics where illnesses such as depression are diagnosed based on brain electrical signatures, as well as a new class of treatments that directly target these electrical patterns. We think that this could parallel the success of engineering devices in other areas of medicine, including pacemakers and cochlear implants. The multidisciplinary proposal that I've laid out today takes advantage of our collaborations in statistical sciences and computer engineering here at Duke, as well as those in psychiatry and bioengineering at our partner institutions. Thank you for this opportunity to present our work, and thank you for considering this proposal.